And hello everyone, we're back to Trek Yards Mission Briefing, your special discussion, review, analysis, theorization show about all ships of Trek. And today's a very special mini-series bonus set of rather cool ships to look at. Stuart, how are you and what we're looking at today? I'm good, thank you for asking, Commander. Um, as for the ship we're looking at, it's one you'd want to take on a three-hour tour mm -hmm. and hopefully not get stranded on an mm -hmm. island or... That would be awkward, know, wouldn't it? In, ...in a large, yeah, exactly, or in a large mm -hmm. ocean somewhere. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it's more for short runs. And we're going to be looking at the USS Minnow today, guys. That's right. The the little ship that took Gilligan and his crew. Well, Skipper and his crew. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Let me check my notes. Read the title. Oh. Look at the it's, thumbnail. Gives that, it away. We're going to be looking at Voyager today. And that would be an <laughs> Intrepid class. Uh, so these are basically small, or small short range, maybe long term, um, uh, scientific mission vessels specifically designed for just you know quick runs not a big crew mm -hmm. but a cool little ship nonetheless and the equinox is the even shorter shorter science vessel this one obviously has a bit more bit more everything on it but it's not exactly designed for comfort um, but as i did say in one of the episodes it was you know very fast and nimble and i believe it's the fastest of the fleet at the time until the uh, e takes over yes and this first picture is it in in dry dock to a great little prequel scene we got to see in the Relativity episode. Uh, I just want to show that as the first one, but the actual first picture is this great uh, new render of the Voyager. And it's worth noting this is Rob Bonshoon, slightly enhanced models, so a slightly different lighting setup, so enjoy the slight enhancedness of the lighting for the Voyager model. Nice. So, Stuart, this ship was launched in 2371, but for the people in the real world, real world, 1995. Do you remember your first impression of this ship? Seeing it on screen, seeing the posters. What did you think at the time? Glad you asked. Yes, I do remember. It was awesome. No, I thought... <laughs> this is an interesting new take on a starship, because all we've seen until then, really, as far as hero ships go, are the standard configuration. Secondary mm. hull, saucer, nacelles. Uh, this was cool to see another version, another style of ship that was going to be the main hero ship. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a great little ship. I wasn't super happy with it um, at first because I had seen uh, seen in the Starlog magazine, I'd seen uh, Rick Sternbach's early concepts of it mm. with the low slung nacelles that were longer mm. and the more pointy front end. And I thought, that's a nice looking ship. I can't wait to see this thing. Of course, there was no internet updates or that I was looking at it at the time. And it came on screen and I'm like... What did they do to it? It's all short and rounded, and no, please don't do that. With stubby, teeny nacelles. Yes, I wasn't super impressed. And the fact that the nacelles articulated, I was like, that's unnecessary. <laughs> um, so overall impression, at first when I saw the concept one, I was like, I really like that. And I still mm. hold true to that day. We've talked about that concept mm -hmm, one with mm -hmm. Rick. Mm. And I still say the same thing. This one took a little while to grow on me, but it is an impressive ship once you get down to the nuts and bolts of it and see what it can do so over a course of seven years. I mean, it's pretty fantastic. So similar to the Galaxy class, in a, in a sense, like it was odd in certain ways. It took a little bit of getting used to, but as soon as you sort of yes. learn to appreciate it, you're like, damn, that, that is nice. Yes, yes, absolutely. How about you? I mean, you kind of... It was a different experience for you, probably. Yeah, I mean, 1995, I was two. So, you know, it was already on the air. I did watch it. I did. Wa I do remember watching the final live and a couple of season seven, maybe a little bit season six. I'm not sure, but I was into Star Trek by the end of it. But it was one of those things where just like with TNG and TOS and the movies, it was all part of the same. Everything in one point in continuity. There was no, like, I didn't have to wait for the six yeah. movies. I was a, couldn't necessarily watch them all when I was young, but I knew they all existed. It was just a broader continuity. So this was just part of that tapestry of the Trek verse. Um, so for me, it was just another cool extension of, of those ship designs. Um, and I thought, you know, different, but I mean, it, 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 I, mean, I, I love Voyager, right? Yeah, I'll say it now. And I, having worked with the 3D model extensively over the years of us, of, of working with it, it's such an incredible ship to light. You can make it look good from almost every angle, any light setup. I mean, it's sleek, but smooth curves. It, it's coloring, it's detail. It's, it's really spectacular. Mm -hmm. And as Rick said in our first episode with him on it, it very, very much is the Galaxy class just reproportioned, but it's a really nice reproportion, and I think it really, really feels great. 
um, and it kind of has that science vibe to me. I'm probably biased, but kind of like all this tech in a place and the way that I don't know. Just I'm biased because I've sort of grown up with it. I mean, I love Voyager because the ships and the tech and the aliens. That's that's my show for those reasons. And this was always a great yeah. ship and very very capable. I mean, it should have been damaged throughout the season, obviously, but yeah. the ship. I mean, it was able to take on a ton of stuff, do a ton of stuff. You know, achieve slipstream and transwarp and you know Delta Fly, all these cool things it was able to do and build. That's a pretty damn resourceful ship. You know, this wasn't like... Is it a resourceful ship or a resourceful crew? It, 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 well, both. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, but obviously, yeah. it, just like the Enterprise, it's all it's a character within the ship, within the show, and it's all part of one big family. I would um, say so it's I, a very versatile ship, jumping yeah. on that. Um, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I've always loved it, and it's certainly one of my favorites, just in terms of style. And and I do agree that the cells are a bit stubby, but that's like a progression of technology. I mean, the Enterprise Dean cells are very small compared to the whole... And these, obviously, even a little bit, probably a little bit smaller in, in proportion, but it's like, well, that says something. It's faster with less. That's amazing. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, well, Stuart, oh, tell yes. me about scale, and I remembered it just before I, I whatever you. So, what, how big do you think this ship is? Now, again, with these hero ships, we're a little bit biased. We've worked with them. We know what they are. Yeah. Uh, we know it's not huge, but how big do you think she is contextually? And just to give you some hints, I've got a render in a minute that I compare it to the TOS colony, the Nova class Prometheus, and the Galaxy class. Okay. So. so it's kind of we'll surprising. Start, we'll start with the TOS Connie, because it's yes. the one I know best. Mm -hmm. This is a little bit longer than the Connie, because um, I have seen many scale charts and mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, as for the Prometheus, and what was the other one? Uh, Equinox. And then oh, the Equinox. The Equinox is shorter than it, mm -hmm. um, not extremely shorter, um, maybe about that much shorter, I don't know. And the Prometheus, I think, would be roughly, I was going to say roughly the same size, but I actually think Prometheus is going to be bigger. Mm -hmm. um, as for the Galaxy class, it's this is the length, length of one of the nacelles. It's the same as the TOS Constitution class, almost. Um, can fit in the saucer or on top of the saucer of the galaxy class easily so there i hope i got those right you're pretty close to everything but not quite so i love these renders because we you know how often do we see those scale charts but never just them two perfectly together you know yeah so picture number three is the galaxy uh, actually the, for the voyager the enterprise and a runabout for the human scale cool, cool. as you would guess real voyager real define real Enterprise from Intermirror Darkly. So again, this is the default CG scales of all the ships. They might be off slightly, but these are the default scales. So I, yeah, I always thought it was about the same size, but I'm kind of surprised that it is bigger because I kind of like the fact that it was, you know, hundreds of years later, you get all this technology in the same small shell and it's like a billion times faster and a smaller crew. Like I kind of liked, but it is actually a good chunk bigger um, in length. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree, and the, and uh, the fact that <coughs> this is strictly a spe it's it's a science ship. It's built for a specific mm. purpose, um, mm. whereas the the Constitution class was an explorer. It was more of a every man every do everything kind of ship because mm. it did have the potential for going to war or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wasn't decked out for that. It wasn't specifically made for that purpose, but it did have that ability. It was more of an exploration vessel, much like Voyager. So it's an interesting tie in to kind of have them be the same size and yet different eras. Yet the Voyager ties in everything that the, that the uh, galaxy class has mm -hmm. holodecks, replicators, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. much more live like comfortable living conditions. Uh, so, but the crew of Voyager was less than the Constitution class. It's like 130, 140. Yeah. Pretty yeah. And, yeah, and the Constitution had 430, so... Yeah. <laughs> Again, that speaks to the comfort level that you got there, so... Um, yeah, I think that's great. And I love the little sh the runabout there. That really puts things into perspective. Uh, we know that there's usually problems with the shuttle bays on ships, especially the TOS ship, and Voyager specifically. <laughs> yeah. um, so if you look at that shuttle... Or that runabout, it'd be interesting. Would it? How well would it fit in the, the Constitution class bays shuttle bay? You know, it probably would, but maybe not lengthwise. Maybe that's what I'm wondering. Like, would yeah. it take up? Like, you know, just park it right. Against well, you, first of all, you you couldn't spit it. You have to you go to the reverse out or go ahead and reverse into <laughs> three point turn. Like you couldn't yeah. <laughs> you couldn't turn. Yeah, but it's, yeah, I mean, 
you know, what do you think Matt Jeffries would think? I mean, this is an, you know, if we're looking at the direct parallels, the first Star Trek Chronicle ship into Voyager. I mean, look how everything's reportioned. The source has been pulled out. I mean, the, it's all been pulled out a lot. The secondary hull's been pulled out a lot, integrated heavily. The, the I mean, the pylons. Hey, this ship has not got weak pylons. You know, other people complain that you know the the refit and other ships. And these pylons are strong as anything. Are they going to survive? Also, the engines just but all the way back. That being said, they articulate, which is obviously a weak point because. <laughs> Uh, you know there would be different different things to make them actually get into position so you say they're strong pylons because they're thicker or longer but the articulation point does weaken them at the same time so i'd say they're comparable as far as strength goes well, well you know those bridges that go up and down those big metal ones i mean the, the articulation yeah, points yeah. i mean how much weaker is that than you know 80 feet in one direction i mean it's not going to be cuz it's still robustly all the weight all the all the you know, uh, all well, the pressures keep it together. I mean, I get that, but I'm just trying to be devil's advocate here and say yeah. that those are weak points. Weak points yeah. on those themselves. Yeah, I guess we've, what, we've. Yeah. What was your original question? Sorry. I mean, yeah. What do you think? You know, Matt Jeffries would think, and you know, if you were, if oh. you, if you had been given this first ship to the second ship, because it's great seeing both together, how it's been reproportioned, but clearly is the same aesthetic. I mean, what, what do you think they'd say and, and think? I wouldn't presume to speak for Matt Jeffries because the man was a genius, but um, I would hope he'd be happy with what he saw. I know he wasn't super impressed with the uh, Enterprise D, hmm. taking my design and turning it into a luxury hotel or however he put it. Um, I thought that was interesting. But I don't know. I would hope he would be happy because this is, you can see the lineage here even. Um, for an exploratory type vessel you can see the progression and it's I, I i hope he'd be happy that's all i can say and it kind of makes me want to see obviously tos colony is famous having a few greeblies and a few details i kind of want to see a version of the enterprise with phaser strips with escape pod hatches like all the same post voyager trappings mm. but exactly i don't think i've ever seen that before i mean we've seen like alternates in Trek online but it's a different design I'd love to see like a red facade version with, with different bits and you know blue brown maybe around both sides actually having grills like a full Voyager version of the same shape would be kind of fun yeah we need to talk to Thomas Maroney see if he can make that for us <laughs> just whip it up but the next view top uh, the, the top is never fully representative the side view yeah oh huh well, this is interesting because this shows a lot more internal volume inside the Intrepid yeah. class with a lot, again a lot smaller crew uh, and yeah, I love when we see the different views. The top doesn't always represent what we're looking hmm. at. Um, That's really interesting. Yeah, so this one would, of course, be more comfortable. But they do have like rooms that the uh, Constitution class doesn't have. Like I said, like holodecks and you know things like that. I'm sure there's more advancements that just you know just didn't have at the TOS era that would be in here. Um, well, I mean, a simple one like deuterium tanks. I mean, they need to have more fuel to run these faster engines. So you need to have more fuel tanks, especially the Voyager is a very, very fast ship. So instantly you need to have more resources, pure resources, more, you know, the warp core is bigger. Yeah. I mean, much, you know, much bigger. Goes throughout the entire ship, you know, things like that. But you need to have just more of them. I'm sure the deflector is bigger as well. Uh, but it's nice because the bridge still feels relatively the same size, so it's not as if it's, like, totally out of proportions, just... Yeah. They've condensed everything and had to stretch and just use the space. It kind of makes you appreciate how how much space they're wasting by having the secondary hull with a neck. Like if they just integrated it all, they could just yeah, you know, they just get so much more ship. And it, interestingly enough, from this view, the one ship that comes to mind for me t as a comparison ship would be the NX refit. Um, just mm. take off the nacelles of the NX refit and have a side profile with the shorter, stubbier neck segment it has mm. and it would look very similar to that uh the, mm. the f hmm. voyager that's interesting so but anyway um mm. Mm. yeah it's cool to see the the similarities here or not not similarities the, the differences hmm. um that like a hundred years makes i mean <laughs> it, it is kind of night and day and yet the same yes and what's interesting about this view is that you very rarely see a side direct view. You, I can always forget the Voyager has a bump that comes out of the saucer at the bottom. Just yeah. a bump. It's just the Aero Shuttle Bay, plus some yeah. little bits of text, just a bump. <laughs> it looks so weird from the side. <laughs> no, I don't think so. It's it, a nice dimensionality. Oh, no, I agree, but it's kind of you don't think of it being there. Yeah. I, I don't think that way. Uh, yeah. 
Or the next shot. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So mm. I didn't know the Equinox was like half the size. Yeah, it's like a. It's a bit small brother. You know, it's a. It's almost like a little cousin. Well, I would have thought. It, I thought it would have been at least reach to the just above, just in front of the bridge module on the Intrepid would be what was what I was thinking. So that's interesting that it is quite the, quite smaller. We've only got a crew of like 60, 70. Yeah. Uh, the Prometheus again, I thought might have been a little bit bigger than that. Okay. But that actually makes a lot of sense. And of course, the Galaxy. That's kind of what I expected. Because the TOS Enterprise is roughly the same size as the as Nacelle. The Nacelle. And it, yeah. And I was just thinking that Voyager was a little bit longer than. So. Yeah, I was kind of surprised too. It is a, a good chunk. It's, it's probably about the same size as the saucer. Yeah. And one one unique thing about Voyager actually, you know, it, it is <laughs> the nacelles actually come. They stop before the end of the ship. So end to end is actually the width of the ship. Whereas normally in the ships you have end of end and then the bonus nacelle. I mean, look at Discovery. Half of it is the yeah. nacelle. Which isn't really the ship, you know. It, these, you know, whereas Voyager, that is the size. It is using all of its uh, volume. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, you can see, I mean, technology, they've really changed their design aesthetic from the Enterprise D, you know, that generation of saying, hey, let's build this, and then let's, let's make a really compact, sleek one. And just the size of those engines, I mean, the fact that you can get that much power of those engines is incredible. Seriously. Yeah. Yeah, because it is the fastest ship of the fleet at the time. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But then a little fun render I thought I would do, uh, picture six, just to show them oh, wow. in this sort of proportion, because we know the Enterprise D is a pretty big ship of internal volume, um, this kind of puts into real perspective. That's yeah. a great shot. I can see that being in one of the movies or whatever, the Intrepid flying overhead. It's not big. It's not big. <laughs> no, but uh, definitely puts it into perspective. You can see the you know, thousand crew versus the hundred and fifty now, can't you? Yeah, it's just the size of the star drive, basically. Yeah, and I would say the the Intrepid does have room for more crew. Um, oh, you yeah. can fit four hundred and thirty on a Constitution class, especially when you look at it from the side. There's a big difference in internal volume. Yeah, but I don't know what exactly the changes are as far as that goes. I know it's a science ship, so there's going to be lots of science labs. You could, if you did, have to. You know, rescue a planet or a ship. You could convert science labs into like, mm. you know, quarters and stuff. I'm sure. But interesting question: Did the TOS Connie have cargo bays? Yes. Could we see it any? Did. Yes, we see them in the well. We see them in the motion picture, the refit. Well, that, I obviously mean the original because in Voyager, obviously, we see their big cargo bays that are just you know two, three decks big. We never see those in the Connie, as far as I'm aware. I wouldn't even know where they put them. You know, you don't get the sense there's any three deck buildings. There's no holodecks. There's no, even the engine room is only two decks. Whereas you know the Voyager has three deck hologra holodecks and three deck, you know, many 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 bigger rooms that obviously suddenly take up more and more space. And obviously, like you said, more science labs and even the quarters. We've been in TOS quarters. They're not big. I mean, they're bigger than you think, but they're not big. The Voyager, they're you know big. For a lot more true. comfort. Yeah. If you t if you make that per person, then it's like exponential yeah and they, they do have cargo bays I'd have to look at the blueprints to find out where they are but yeah they do they have dedicated and plus they have big fabrication facilities mm. on the TOS Enterprise that take up a lot of room but mm. anyway we're not talking about that right now no no I love this shot by the way it's going in my wallpaper folder thank you <laughs> uh, next up we have an MSD of the Voyager of that's one thing that always bothers me. Does it bug you when people call it the Voyager or the Voyager? Why would you call it the Voyager? Well, you did once already in this episode. You called it the Voyager, and I was going to ask you about it. Yeah, you did. They do it in the show all the time, too. I mean, you do say the Enterprise, you know, well, the it's Prometheus, a, but Voyager... It's a pronoun for a context, isn't it? I know, but the Voyager always sounds odd to me, and they use it quite often. Get back to the Voyager. No, get back to Voyager, please. Huh. <laughs> get back to Enterprise. Get back to the Enterprise. They both work a little, a little bit better. I don't know. I'm sorry to that, cause you pain. It's just something that bothers me. And you you did say it early on, and I was going to mention it then, but I thought, yeah, that'll come in later. I'll talk about it. I, and I just said it now, unconsciously. So that's why I was asking about it. So MSD. <laughs> MSD. You, you can see a four deck or five deck. Oh no, wait, hold on. That's a one, two, three, four, five, six deck 
warp core. Shuttle bay with bonus. And there, there, there is a surprise shuttle bay that appears out of nowhere in the show, so it's kind of like how many shuttle bays are there? There's been no full technical readouts of the ship to kind of work that out. Um, very compact. I mean, that's yeah. Very few turbulence tubes as well. That's why oh, from this, yeah, from the side. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but they do go throughout the whole ship. So, I also love the um, retractable landing legs, mm. the little bays for those. I mean, to be fair, that's a pretty substantial amount of stuff you have to pack in the ship. I mean, how many crew quarters of that is the TOS and you know the original colony? So you're losing space every time you add a new function. Yep. Yep. An after torpedo launcher again, space they have to you know, the more you add, the more space you lose. We got the two main computer cores there, which is cool. Um, Big ass tanks in the middle. I love the secondary deflector on this thing. I thought always thought yeah. that was a great idea. In case the main one goes down, you can still at least do something. It, it helped punctuate the space there. Yeah, it worked really well. Yeah, yeah. And you would also assume too that the secondary deflector would help with um, taking scientific readings and stuff while at warp. The main deflector could worry hmm. about. Deflection yeah. capabilities. The smaller one up front could be like scanning, because mm. it is a sensor and deflector kind of combination. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah, absolutely. But let's do it. The next picture is the aft view, and again, I mean, I was lighting these shots for the different angle, but just beautiful. I mean, it's so easy and so nice to light, and it looks so good. You know, all the different glowy bits. Mm -hmm. I love the impulse drives, the grills, the the energy feel, but simple. You know, I love the landing bay on the on the back. Just the way the hull curves in, it feels advanced. It feels organic. It feels, you know, I just mm. love the ship. Yeah, I, uh, I was I always forget that I love this ship when people talk about it until I'm looking at it and I'm like, actually, this is kind of nice. While while I look at it, it has me hypnotized, and then once I go away from it for a while, it's like, oh yeah, it was, it was all right, you know. But yeah, this one absolutely works. Uh, it's a great shot. I love the torpedo tubes up front, yeah, at the at the top there. Um, yep. But there's that damn shuttle bay, which is confounding for the size. But well, we have a dedicated picture that played drama, which we'll, we'll jump into. Um, cool. Now, did you ever want? Do you ever think, you know? Why aren't the warp grills going around the entire engine like the D was? Do you think that would have been an improvement if they had been at least around the back and, and further? Because it's odd kind of uh, to have them only on one bit of one side. Would have been interesting to see that. I don't. I never really thought about it. I didn't neither had I. <laughs> um, but it's obviously a new form of warp propulsion because it does have the articulation matrix yeah. or whatever. So. Who knows? I mean, I would like to see a version of it that had that. I think it would be incorporated like seamlessly and look fantastic. Mm -hmm. I would like to see that, but I don't think it's needed. I've never mm -hmm. been a proponent of the line of sight rule anyway. And I wanted to get I want to about it a little bit later anyway. But you mentioned articulation. The next picture is the same angle, but articulated, because these things obviously move in 3D. That's how it looks when articulated, nice high def. It doesn't I mean it doesn't look Bad articulated. It kind of has an an interesting elegance to it. Would you not say? Uh, yeah, I do. yeah, I would exactly. I prefer them straight down. But again, it's, it comes back to like the bird of prey. I don't like it in attack wing formation. I like it in cruising, or even landing. Such a controversial opinion, Stuart. I really don't <laughs> care. <laughs> um, it'd be cool to see the angled struts like that, but have the engine be sitting level. That would look kind of neat, actually. What do you mean? Same level? Well, the engine's obviously angled. Oh, oh you mean the pylon's angled. Cell. Oh, okay. Yes. Ah. Just change the nacelle and have it be that that's its normal configuration. That'd be kind of neat. Well, it's like, would you... Do you I mean, if you go to the next picture, it's a front view. Um, less obvious, but do you think this works better for the design? Having those classically up engines? I don't think so. Okay. I really don't. I, I just for the new style, the new age of ships. I kind of like the straight out approach. Um, the articulation was just kind of kind of a gimmicky thing, but every time I see it like this, I thought it'd be cool if the nacelles, once they rotated up, mm. also rotated. Mm. So you could get kind of like 
that kind of vibe. I don't know. Well, I mean, the obvious implication, if it was a wraparound, as is in the D and the Excelsior and such, uh, or partially the, the warp grills, then obviously that would create a line of sight if they moved. Um, speaking of, the next picture shows the engines as well as a close-up. Um, there's not really a line of sight in the standard, and there is certainly isn't in the other motion. Um, since they're only on one side, and we know why there are grills on the inside to create that. So this ship, is, you know, there's a ship in between, and there aren't even grills. So there's is a line of sight. Having, is it is a warp field having to go around and touch the other one? I mean, there's, a, there's not even grills that side, Stuart. How do we rectify this line of sight rule? Easy line of sight was never a rule until Gene was in a bad mood one day and said that, that it was. <laughs> Sounds like something I would do. Um, no, it's it's. And the Defiant doesn't have it either. Even if it was line of sight, let's say TOS era, fine. We get it. It evolved. They've changed the method because the Defiant doesn't really have it. Um, well, it's meant to have something, but not exactly. I know, but no ships really... A lot, um, not no ships. A lot of ships kind of go away from it, even mm -hmm. enemy ships and stuff. So I don't understand why it can't change, why technology can't be adapted to... Because that happens in our daily lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... No problem with the not line of sight rule. Um, it would be neat though if they did have if this was like turned into a TOS era ship and you had the inner grill line lined up there and when it went up it did articulate yeah. so it could do that. That'd be neat. Yeah, but not necessary in my opinion. Yeah, it's one of those things where obviously we can we can just name off alien ships that they have some sort of warp. But they don't have the way we use it, and yet they can still generate warp without a visible line of sight. So obviously there's something, yeah. you, you can't just say, you know, warp coils inside the ship that create internal warp fields, because that's probably dangerous, as why they're on the outside. So obviously there's a point when the technology either changes or adapts or evolves to move away from the line of sight rule. And I'm fine with that, like you said, up until a certain point. But then, wouldn't, wouldn't that be one of the first things that you, or at least, wouldn't that be a thing in a bucket list of Starfleet engineers to try and overcome, you know? Because if you can overcome the line of sight, you can suddenly make all these new designs that yeah. might let you achieve the warp nine barrier, let you achieve warp nine point nine five. You know, these. I mean, this is the fastest ship of the fleet. Maybe their their version of line of sight it going through the pylons, whatever, Why, or wireless line of sight. You know, doesn't even need to have or sightless line of sight. Yeah, you know, that, that's, warp missiles. that's the thing that helped it jump into the top warp, warp spills. Obviously, you know, we have the yeah, <coughs> Prometheus and and Sovereign still having those familiar line of sight rules um, so obviously it's not abandoned but you know I'm fine with certain ships and things working because you know yeah yeah and even no, that's kind of going off topic a little bit but I was going to say even three nacelle ships would be able to have line of sight in the TOS era mm. we've explained that many times mm. but anyway let's move on I guess. well I was just going to ask what your question about uh, oh. the warp nacelles themselves I mean the design because you never really think they have this little weird lippy thing at the front I mean, they kind of look like permanent markers is, is what I'm seeing when I look at it like this yeah they do kind of look like a 90s permanent marker yeah absolutely um, I, I'm fine with them I mean I prefer the Enterprise D ones almost all the shielding on them is I don't know it's just something about them I'm not really a huge fan of I don't know what it is from this angle it looks like you know, it's like a glowing snake eye. Mm. <laughs> it's like a snake's body. Um, but no, I, I never really thought about them much. I just, they don't appeal to me. Well, it's one of those things where when we used to do this show, we just used pictures that we could find online and we can never get real close-ups. Yeah. You know, now we can do it an, an out-of-context just close-up and I never really thought, again, we, we analyze this in a mission briefing that, like we never do any other show, you know. I never really considered how, how little of it is a Bassard intake. How much shielding there is to actual glow elements. I mean, that is kind of absurd. When you look at the Enterprise D, boom, it's everything. Or you look, at, you know, that. I mean, it's interesting that Rick went that far in the other direction. You know, I mean, the, it's an interesting design choice. I guess that's I mean, that's part of the line of sight rule to have it all armored, to having the engine be internal, doesn't need to have a whatever. But it's interesting that it's so different. And for a ship that's so fast, to have so minimal minimal facade collecting ports. It's like oh, okay, that's, must be hyper efficient. Yeah, I would assume hyper efficiency, but and, and uh, one little thing, do you know, the, uh, in the front of the impulse engine, there are those uh, uh, runabout sort of intakes. Yeah, supercharging intake with a nice touch. Or it could also be reversing impulse drives as well. 
That'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah. Because they are the same glow elements as the back ones. So. Well, that's it, guys. Tune in for the next part, which is next week. Next week? So I have to wait a whole week for the next part? Oh. You do indeed. But that's. But we'll see you then. Bye. See you then. Bye.